everyone and welcome to our ETAC webinar on cybersecurity. I'm Simone and I'm ETAC's EAP project manager. I've had the pleasure to meet some of you who mentioned during the community consultations that this webinar topic is really needed. Um, as you may know, this webinar is part of a series of webinars run by ETAC, which are primarily, primarily designed to help advocates from the Falun Gong and Uyghur communities in an effort to end the atrocities being perpetrated against them by the Chinese state. As we know, these atrocities include forced organ harvesting, which is killing of innocent people for their organs to be sold uh, to paying recipients. We are also concerned that the Tibetans and Christians may also be victims of forced organ harvesting. So welcome to any Tibetans and Christians who may be joining us today. The focus of today's webinar is to protect yourself from online hacking attacks by learning practical ways to keep your email safe and private, keep your information and important documents secure and safeguard your online presence. We have just put up a poll, we're just about to put up a poll here, uh, which you will see on your screen so that we can get an idea of everyone's knowledge on the subject before we begin. So please click on the poll and enter your level of knowledge about cybersecurity. So it's a scale where one means no knowledge at all and 10 means you're an expert on the subject. Thank you so much. And I'd now like to introduce Jacob Ling and Wing Truman, who are our speakers for today. Jacob has 10 years of experience in the field. He's a cybersecurity consultant and network engineer who specializes in defending independent journalists and newsroom. He's advised indigenous and community leaders, human rights activists, and independent journalists investigating organized crime, corruption, and state abuses. Wing is also a cybersecurity uh, consultant with over 20 years of experience in IT. He has worked for international food and beverage manufacturers, international systems integrators, and national retailers. And he's passionate about helping advocacy groups and nonprofit organizations improve their cybersecurity. So during the presentation, please feel welcome to write questions that come in mind in the Q&A that you will see on your screen. After the presentation, we'll make sure that we have time to go through these. I'll now hand over to Wing. Thanks, Wing. Thank you, uh, Simone, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, just bear with me while I share my screen, get the slides up. Let me know when it comes up. Yep, we're good. Excellent. All right. So, um, the topic for today uh, is cybersecurity, obviously. Um, we'll be diving deep into the three main areas of email, identity, and data. So, let's just jump right into it. All right. So what we'll start with is actually a little video and why we want to illustrate why cybersecurity is important, right? So we'll start with a little video and this is a little video, a promotion video or an educational video. Um, and the theme is a fortune teller, right? So just bear with me while this loads up. I'm going to leave this. I think that I get well with it. It's got well negative of your bank rekening. Yeah? On the seven, last month, mm -hmm. you spent 200 euros on alcohol. No. Vorige maand, 300 euro on clothing you spent. Eight. Yeah. Five. For a house that van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 250.000 euro. Ja, maar eigenlijk. 41. Ja. Serieus? Ja, serieus. Oh my god. Oh man. Ah, dat is heel eng. I hope everyone was able to get the gist of that video. Um, it was just highlighting that, um, you know, with things like Facebook We've and social media. Yeah. Sorry? 
So with social media, we actually share a lot of information online and that can act, the information we share online can be actually used against us, right? Another reason why cybersecurity is important is it's always in the headlines, all right? So this is uh, some recent headlines from actually from October the 1st, so just a couple of days ago. Now I picked this one because uh, obviously it's actually highlighting Chinese hackers um, specifically targeting Windows 10 users. And also uh, this second piece of news was a fake Amnesty International antivirus, right? So this, this other piece of news was particularly targeted at uh, activists like us. And also security is important because our devices know a lot about us, right? This little infographic just kind of illustrates the type of information that um, our, you know, our smartphone, which essentially is a little computer that we carry around all the time, knows about us. You know, we store passwords in the web browsers. Uh, we might use our phone for payments. Uh, we have our contacts, so our names and phone numbers of our contacts on our phone. Um, and if we enable it, we might be constantly sharing our location as well. Uh, for anyone interested in more information, there's actually a link to a YouTube which talks about you know, the type of information that is shared from the smart devices around our home as well. Next off, we're going to drill into passwords, right? Because a lot of the time when we think about computer security, the first thing that comes to mind is passwords, right? So I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to take it over to Jake to run this, but we'd like everyone to um, go, go, go over to a site called Have I Been Pwned? So just bear with me while I switch screens. And guys, it's it's funny spelling. Pwned is owned with, with a P. So if you want to open up a new tab, or uh, open up or on your phone and type in "Have I been uh, p w n e d dot com," and what we want to try and do here is put in our email address and see if our email has been involved in a data breach. So that means any old accounts that you've you've used in the past, for example, MySpace. LinkedIn, uh, 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 photo bucket. There's, there's hundreds of old accounts in there. We want to check if our personal email address has been leaked onto the dark web. So uh, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I, I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to to see if uh, if you can do that. And we've also got another website that we want to try and engage the audience here. It's called HowSecureIsMyPassword.net. And so if we can take a couple of uh, two minutes or something for the um, and to, to uh, see if you guys yourselves can check out how secure is your password or if your email has been in, involved in a data breach, it'll communicate how important this stuff is to you. And so here uh, we've, uh, Wing has put in a, an email address and it's been pwned, P-W-N-E-D, means it's been involved in a number of data breaches. And so, look, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s. If you've been around the internet for a while, your email address will have been involved in a data breach. It just it happens all the time. And how we protect ourselves from that is by changing uh, the password after a data breach and also using unique passwords for every different account that you're registered with on the internet. Alrighty. I think we've got another slide of uh, how secure is my password. Now, this is a really fun one here. If people want to try and open this up in a new tab at home or on their on their on their phone, uh, we we put in the enter password and we can type in password or we can type in anything that we think is a any type of password and it'll show how long it takes to crack that password. Now, it, currently the computational power of the best computers on earth. Is, is phenomenal. And to give you an idea of perspective, uh, during the Apollo land, uh, uh, lunar or, or moon landings, uh, there is now more computational power in a phone than in all of NASA during the, the moon landings. And so as computational power just gets faster and faster, uh, it, its ability to crack password gets faster and faster as well. So this is why we need to put complex passwords capitals, uh, uh, letters, uh, uh, and 
never, you know, your pet's name or anything, uh, or, or never password or never QWERTY or one, two, three, four. These are passwords that will be cracked instantly. Alrighty, so just bear with me while I switch back to the slide deck. Let me know when that comes up, Jake. Uh, yep, I can see that there. All right, All right. so Jake just demonstrated the uh, password strength checker. Um, encourage everyone to have a play with that. Um, ideally, you probably shouldn't put your exact passwords in there. But the idea here with passwords is to use a long password or a long string of, say, three unrelated words, right? And that generally length makes it much harder for uh, computers to guess your password. All righty, let's dive right into email. Okay, so how do they break in? This little infographic um, is, although it says ransomware, it actually provides a really good summary of um, the main methods that an attacker would try to get into your computer or your account, right? So on the far left of, this, of the slide, you can see phishing, password guessing, exploiting software weaknesses, and email. Now phishing, essentially is trying to trick you into giving up your uh, username and password on a fake website, right? Password guessing may be related to either using what we just saw from data, known um, data breaches, uh, your username and existing old usernames and passwords, or actually just guessing random simple passwords against your email address. Exploiting software weaknesses relates to um, when you don't proactively update your software, uh, there could be known weaknesses that can be uh, exploited to gain access to your computer. And lastly, email is quite often used as a delivery mechanism to, for example, to deliver malicious documents or malware, right? Because if everyone's got an email address. Um, a lot of people, uh, if you're not in the corporate world, you probably won't have special um, or additional email filtering to protect yourselves. Um, and that's where uh, attackers can send through email malicious documents and malware. Okay, we'll jump back into passwords again and we'll, we'll go into a little video. So bear with me while we share and load up this video. We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's its name? Jameson. Jameson. And where'd you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hempfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. <laughs> it's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. So we just wanted to demonstrate how a reporter uh, was what we would you call use a technique called social engineering, um, gain or trick you into giving up your password. So just bear with me while we go back to the slide deck. Jack, let me know when that comes up. Good. Cool. All right. So passwords, you know, that is kind of the key to your email account. All right. And that's why it is so important to, to know good practices when it comes to passwords. This little slide just talks about some common do's and don'ts or good, good practices and bad practices. You know, at the top of that list is to use a password manager because password managers help you maintain unique passwords for every single website that you use, right? Um, and obviously keep passwords to yourself, right? You don't share your house keys with everyone, right? Uh, so, and you should, that's why you should keep them to yourself. And always where it's available, use MFA or multi-factor authentication and we'll cover that a bit later. What don't you do? Well, you shouldn't use the same password everywhere because if that password is compromised, People will use that same password, that known password, on lots of different websites. Just, just try to see what they can get into. Don't save your passwords in your browser. I highly tell, always tell people not to do that because it's very easy to reveal um, saved passwords in your browser when your computer is actually compromised. And don't save passwords in a file on your computer. Again, if your computer is stolen or um, is infected with a bit of malware, attackers can just very easily obtain that file or grab, copy that file and start accessing your account, probably without you even knowing. 
So password managers to the rescue, right? This is an action, you know, we've tried to highlight this deck with a little uh, tick checklist down the bottom or checklist icon down the bottom to highlight some actions you can take. You know, we, I, I had, we had a look around. Um, there's both cloud and local based um, password managers. At the moment, I would recommend to our communities out there to use locally installed um, password managers, if you have no, especially if you have no experience with password managers. And the reason why that is, is because if you've never used a password manager, right, and you don't use it properly, and it is cloud-based, you actually might be putting yourself at greater risk. So once you are familiar with using a local password manager, then consider using a cloud one. Okay, MFA. All right, so to today we won't dive too deeply in into how to set up MFA for all of your accounts. But this link is actually to an Australian government website where they've kind of gathered the basics around all of the steps behind how you can turn on multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication for your main account, such as your Apple ID, your Facebook, your Gmail, your Twitter, et cetera. So I highly recommend people uh, to visit this site and step through them. It's also not very difficult to have a Google around, you know, which account you want to secure and look for MFA or how to enable it in your account. But going into this is probably a bit uh, uh, beyond uh, this current presentation. So email services, right? Is your email account safe, right? Have you ever noticed uh, people are telling you that they are receiving emails from you that you didn't send, right? That is a telltale sign that maybe someone is accessing and sending emails from your account. There's also other indicators, such as uh, when an attacker accesses your account, they might be setting up forwarding rules, right? What forwarding rules means is that every copy of the email that you receive is forwarded to another address, right? So if you suspect either of these things, ask your tech person to help. You know, are there suspicious accessing attempts? Are there suspicious forwarding rules? and ask them for help to clean up your account or actually to or even consider abandoning that account. Okay, email providers that care about privacy. Now everyone knows um, on the internet now that a lot of, there are a lot of free email providers and it also commonly know that when a product or a, something is free on the internet, it means that you are the product, right? Now, you know, so what that means is that, you know, services like a Gmail or Yahoo or things like that, right, where your email isn't encrypted, they're actually analyzing the contents of the, uh, or computers are analyzing the contents of your emails to help push advertising to you, right? Now, these two platforms that we're suggesting, Tutanota and Proton Mail, right, they were actually uh, really care about privacy, right? And the big arrow is pointing to what we call end-to-end -end encrypted mail, right? And this is, you know, in our field of activism, I highly encourage people if you're if to use one of these providers, right? If you're comfortable with changing your email address, it's you know, changing email address I understand is not a simple matter, um, but you know, security is also important to consider using one of these services which provide end-to-end -end email encryption. Now, if if People within your team use the same service. For example, if they're all on Tudor Nota or they were all on ProtonMail, it is actually highly secure because the emails within the system itself are all encrypted. All righty. Web filters, right? So web filters aren't directly related to email, but the reason why I highlighted this is, um, and what web filters are, is basically there's services like Netcraft, which provide a browser extension, right? If you're running Windows, you might have noticed Chrome or um, uh, Microsoft Edge, when you browse a suspicious website, it actually pops up with a red warning telling you, are you sure you want to proceed, right? The Netcraft browser extension um, also gives you a similar capability. It might be a bit small on your screen, but actually in the text, it actually says, real-time protection from malicious sites, including phishing sites, fake shops, et cetera, right? So people actually report malicious sites or known bad sites to Netcraft. And that little uh, browser extension, when you browse the website, 
actually checks against that list and will actually throw up a warning with you if it is a known bad site. Now, for the more technically uh, savvy of you out there, uh, another thing you can consider is to use DNS services for web filtering as well, right? They obviously blacklist um, known bad sites or known phishing sites to make sure that you are not a victim of phishing or uh, not, not a victim of uh, known malware distribution points. Okay, so that's about it in regards to email. Next, we'll dive into identity. So you want to protect your identity. We'll start with our social accounts. Again, we'll take you to a little video, so just bear with me while we load it up. Your Facebook page. Okay, I'll search Facebook I'm now. Searching Google. I have a phone number. I've got his email address. Okay, Carly, are you ready for information on Damien? Yeah. Yep, I am. Mother's maiden name is He banks with Carly, this is the girl coming in there with the blue scarf. What's the name? Nicholas. Nicholas. His date is birth, 7th May. She lives at 38A. Just a couple of seconds. Two children, her age, four hundred. Previous address. She's got a show. Yeah, got it. Damien, age yeah. 26 and a fitness instructor. How do you know him? Where did you go to UCL? Martin went to South Thames College, assistant psychologist at Great Ormond Street. How did you know? I don't know. You know I'm a Christian as well. Oh, yeah, we know everything about you, Martin. Yeah, you know. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Anna, from Russia. Okay. So we'll just go back to the slide deck. Now, I hope that kind of helped illustrate um, this Excellent. video I, I cut from the start. Um, just let me know when the slides are back, Jake. The slides back, Jake? Yeah, anyway, I'll assume the slides are back. Um, this little video was of a cafe where they, on, on the front of it, it said, if you like our web page or like us on Facebook, you'll get a free coffee and, and a, a a little snack, right? So people jumped onto Facebook and liked them, and just merely by liking them, they shared, you know, who they were, right? It might be, you know, Cameron liking them, right? And then you saw someone, you know, sitting behind a computer looking up their details, and the the barista was writing down um, all their personal details that they posted on social media, right? So you know, what seemingly looked like simply buying a coffee, right, where you liked them. Right, and this goes back to what you share on Facebook or your social media. Right, um, we had a look around, and we highly recommend this website called Reclaim the Net, where they go into some detail on how to review your Facebook privacy settings. Right, so if you if you do choose to use Facebook or um, your social media for outreach or or other reasons, do review your Facebook privacy settings. VPNs, okay. So what are some VPN providers, right? Now VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, all right? And uh, a lot of you might have heard of something called an IP address, right? When you type in that little web address into the location bar, it actually translates to it to an IP address. An IP address is kind of like a phone number for a computer on the internet, right? But what people don't realize is that there's actually databases of IP addresses out there on the internet or phone books, right? And those phone books have information on geolocation data, right? Or where potentially that IP address is, right? When you use a VPN, what you can do is actually hide your true location or you hide your real IP address and actually pretend to be somewhere else in the world. So what does your IP reveal about you? Now, when I created these two screenshots, I was actually using a VPN service and I actually selected China as my location. And this is where, why you see my location says Shenzhen or China in the top left. Another site called ipinfo.io 
you can see, you know, it says the provider is uh, in Singapore or somewhere. But down the very last line, it says Shenzhen again, right? The, the one on the right is probably a little bit more technical, but uh, you get the idea that your IP, when locked up in an IP location database, can potentially reveal your location. Now, this, this one was just based in the city, but some of them actually go down to even um, very specific locales. So VPNs. So VPN services, right? Now, we had a look around and um, because I, the VPN service I currently use, I wouldn't recommend anymore because they were acquired by another service. Uh, currently, we would recommend people to look at um, NordVPN or Surfshark VPN uh, for various reasons. Uh, you can explore the links down below on why we would recommend those, um, both from a cost and a, a speed perspective. Now, VPNs do carry a cost, uh, a cost to them. I understand that a lot of um, uh, community groups may be stretched in that, from that perspective, but a lot of these VPNs offer multiple device access, right? Um, and also offer access to multiple platforms. So do speak to your tech person on how you could best implement these solutions uh, economically. Messaging, all right. So I'm assuming most people have heard of the Signal app, right? The you know, Signal app has is available on all your smart devices and also uh, a web app and, or on your Mac and, and Windows laptop as well. Uh, we highly recommend Signal because it was actually recommended by Snowden. Their encryption is very sound. Telegram is also um, quite popular. And I do know that Telegram was actually quite widely used during the uh, Hong Kong protests, right? Now, I used to be uh, quite a fan of Telegram as well. Um, and primarily that was because, you know, you don't, when you use a handle on Telegram, you don't reveal your phone number. But after, you know, having a deeper look at it, and you can have a look for yourself on the Telegram software on Wikipedia, whether it is a suitable platform for yourself. Right, there has been a lot of a criticism of their security, right? Um, but you know, Telegram is one of the few platforms out there where, when you form groups, you're not revealing your uh, real phone number. Now, if you do choose to do this, and, and I encourage uh, reporters or journalists out there to do this, uh, is to actually register, you know, your secure messaging accounts with a separate SIM card. Right, so go and buy a prepaid SIM card, right? Pop that into your phone, set up your Signal and WhatsApp or whatever uh, messaging services you have, and then pop back. Uh, when, once you're auth authenticated and those, those accounts are set up, then put back your original SIM card, right? And only keep that SIM card when you change phones and you need to register or connect your Signal and Telegram accounts. And if you need help with that, obviously go and ask for your local tech person to help you with that. So that's messaging. Next, we'll dive into data, right? And first of all is surveillance, and I'll hand it over to Jake. So we're gonna talk about surveillance and why all the tools that my colleague Wing has talked about are so important when navigating the web nowadays. Now, this first slide is a calculator from Forbes. Forbes is a big financial magazine. And it actually lets you calculate how much your personal data is worth. And so we can see on the right hand side, 67 cents. It's, it's not for any of us. Uh, it's not worth very much. Um, but this, say for example, uh, data knows if we're about to get divorced, if we're going to buy a house, if we've just bought a new dog or a cat. And these are things that make our, our, our data go up and down, fluctuate up and down. If you look at the next um, uh, slide, it shows the pyramid of data. What type of data is more, it's more sought after by surveillance capitalism and as I'll touch on later, espionage services. So our full name, date of birth, place of birth, you know, that's kind of low on the pyramid. Uh, it's already out there. A lot of times it's, it's, um, uh, either government or big corporations already have this num this type of data. 
But the PII data, say for example, your Medicare number, if you're an American, your social security number, uh, any type of biometric data, which is your fingerprints, your, your iris, or a face scan is worth a lot on the on the um, on this data pyramid. The next slide. Uh, so we've already talked about have I been pwned, and it's all about data breaches. Uh, and so now we'll talk about the weakest link is all of those old websites that you've forgotten about. So if you've been around the web for a while, and 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 because the web uh, you probably have an old MySpace account, old Gmail, all of these old accounts that we no longer use anymore. Now these, if, if say for example, an old company that doesn't update their security anymore, if it gets hacked and it's involved in a data breach and then your information gets leaked in that data breach, it'll appear on the right hand side of have I been pwned. So we've got LinkedIn, a big, um, it's a massive company. We've got MySpace, Oxfam, Tumblr, hundreds of more massive companies that have been involved in data breaches. So these next couple of slides are going to talk about why it's important to take stock of all of your old uh, accounts and and start deleting them or start changing uh, your, uh, uh, just making sure that they're not changing your password on the old accounts. Now there are two great websites, justdelete.me, and that gives you, uh, say, descriptions or details of how to delete your old eBay your Facebook or any type of old account that you might have. And it just gives you a list of just how to easily delete it and so to make sure that that data is not lying around. The next slide, we have account killer, accountkiller.com. So, and it's similar to just delete me and it's just a, a just a way to keep all of, um, uh, to take stock. It, it's sometimes it's worth going to just delete.me and accountkiller.com. Uh, for the next slide, we have, uh, and this is why it's important. Uh, there's an actual massive marketplace for old accounts. Here we've got LinkedIn accounts. Uh, you can buy old LinkedIn accounts for thirty dollars to twelve thousand dollars. And this is uh, this is on the clear web. This is not on the dark web. This is uh, as to say, for example, people involved with marketing like to get old accounts that they seem real, they seem legitimate, and they use them for fake TripAdvisor profiles, uh, fake you know for hotels or Yelp. And then these old accounts can be used for, for much more nefarious purposes. So for example, phishing attacks, or, uh, and here we've got old Gmail accounts. Again, they're, they're worth money on a marketplace. And so if you get an email that from a, an old account that seems legit, it's, uh, it, it could be uh, used by someone else. The next slide, we're gonna talk about Facebook a bit and why it's a bit of a problem. And here I've got a meme of Mark Zuckerberg, who I call, the Count Dracula of data harvesting. Now, the meme says, the more of your data I gather, the more I understand what it means to be human. And, and by this, uh, all of the data at Hoover's up about us are, are analyzed by our algorithms. Facebook knows more about you than your mother, your best friend, than sometimes even yourself, because it's, it's, it's incredibly sophisticated software and it's over a period of time, it, it, it's, um, it can track your uh, navigations on the web. If we look at the next slide, we have Mark Zuckerberg strutting down and uh, he's one of the richest men in the world. And if we look at what, what he loves to do is, uh, again, if he can get more and more people to get onto, the, onto his, his, um, his platforms, he makes more money. And here's a New York Times article that says, Mark Zuckerberg covers his laptop camera. You should consider it too. So uh, with these little laptop cameras, they cost $5. You can get about uh, five or six. So you can get them on Amazon. It's a really cheap, really easy way to just um, uh, not have to worry. And I know some people put um, Bluetack up on their um, up on their webcam, uh, but sometimes these, these cheap uh, webcam cameras are a fantastic way just to keep yourself secure because if something compromises your computer, uh, and they can get a direct line of sight into you. It, it, it can, or your microphone, or it, it can actually analyze a lot of a lot of data about you. So, in the next slide, we have a, this was I'm not sure if people remember FaceApp. Now, FaceApp it happened in 2017 when some people might remember everyone was posting selfies of themselves getting older. And so, what FaceApp did was take a photo and then use artificial intelligence to make us age or get younger. And so it went viral. I had 
hundreds of friends around uh, because I'm involved in cybersecurity and I imagine Wing as well. We were going, don't download that app. And what uh, became apparent is this app was uh, created in Russia and it was uh, siphoning a lot of this, um, a lot of this information. So, so perfect uh, photos of people's faces, which could be biometric data. And so we've got a CBC News title down the bottom. All your friends are posting aging selfies with FaceApp, a Russian app that's raising privacy concerns. Uh, so if we go to the next page, uh, Facebook, it's good not to install apps. Anything like FaceApp, anything, keep it just to the bare bones. What, what I know is, is a common problem is also the problem of catfishing, sometimes called sock puppets. And this is when people on Facebook or on any other type of social network uh, are not who they appear to be. And there's a lot of, in Australia, some of the biggest scams uh, are, are called romance scams. And that's where, say for example, a, a good looking guy or a beautiful woman starts talking, wants to, to get involved in a relationship. The, the man might be a military man who's uh, American. He's been posted in uh, Syria and he's looking for love and he uses a, you know, a really great photo. If you use a tool called uh, uh, Google Reverse Images or tinai.com uh, reverse image search or socialcatfish.com, you can actually look at that image and to see if it's an original image or if the person's a catfish. That is, it's a fake person. Uh, it, it's not a beautiful woman who's, it, it's probably, someone who's uh, had their, uh, from the Ukraine, from Russia, from, uh, from uh, 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 taking advantage of us and, and yeah. And so these are great little tools to help prevent trolls, stock puppets and catfish. So for the next page, now this is a meme that I, f I find it's uh, kind, of, kind of funny. We've got up the top how people think they get hacked and there's this stereotype about anyone that's cyber security, they got the hoodie. They, they look, they're in a dark room and they're trying to hack. And oftentimes, hacking, it's much more simple. It's when you're on Facebook and there's a test that it says, uh, you know, what was your, your pet's name? What was your rapper's name? And it, it, it elicits information about you. And this is, a lot of times we're broadcasting all this information on Facebook that we don't realize. And, and a lot of times memes, uh, applications are ways that um, that uh, people are able to crack a password because all that information's out there. On the next slide, now we've already talked about FaceApp, which was a Russian app. Uh, now we're going to talk about another app, which was called This Is Your Digital Life. Now, um, a lot of people around the world downloaded this app, uh, and a, a British consulting firm, we've linked to the um, to the United Kingdom our military. Or which which its specialty was elections, used all the information harvested from this app, this is your digital uh, life, to, uh, to find out uh, very detailed maps about the 2016 election in America. Now, what was very fascinating about this, the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, 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 hack was you didn't have to have downloaded this is your digital life, have your information, sucked up by Cambridge Analytica. If one of your friends installed the app, then your information as well would be uh, part of this part of this data breach. And if we look at the next um, uh, slide, uh, Cambridge Analytica, a whistleblower came out. Uh, this is after the 2016 election and said that there was a lot of, um, it came uh, uh, saying that these lax Facebook security standards help help uh, all this incredibly detailed personal information of us, and it ended up getting into the hands of the Russian FSB. So, as, as espionage security services of Russia used Cambridge Analytica, which is a UK firm's data, which came from a, a seemingly benign app called This Is Your Digital Life. So, on the next page. Uh, these are some tools to help us reduce our footprint. So we're just, we need to try and reduce all the information we're sending out there. Now, Google is really easy, it's convenient, but sometimes it's better to turn that YouTube history off, turn your location history off. Uh, and there's a link where through the My Activity on your Google account where you can actually reduce this information. 
And even if, if this information comes with Google, if your Gmail gets hacked, like it did with John Podesta, the chief of staff of Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election, like this is, this is information that's really sought after by, uh, again, uh, anyone in surveillance capitalism, any type of, um, marketing that kind of, uh, that, that, uh, aggregates data from everyone and also espionage and, and security services from around the world. The next page. On your phones, you have a permission model. Every time you download an app, uh, it'll ask you, the app will ask you, can I access the camera? Can I access the microphone? Normally you should say no. Now there are, are apps like WhatsApp that of course you want to give it access to the microphone because you'll be talking on the phone with it. But there are other apps on your phone that have no need to have access to your, uh, microphone or your camera and so sometimes it's better to be very judicious and make sure uh, these permissions are, are very strict on the next page we have a smudge attack now this is an interesting one uh, uh it sometimes frightens me how many people uh especially older people who do not have a password on their phone and this means if you don't have a password if you lose it uh, someone's got all that information, uh, but even if you do have a password, if you're doing, uh, if, if your password's one where you have to draw a pattern, uh, this is a way for someone to uh, try and crack that password. They look at the phone under a certain type of light and then they can deduce from the smudge how to crack open that phone. So guys, always have a password and, it, and make sure that password's complex. So if, if you do lose that phone, stuff's not going to get out there. So here we have uh, Super Anti Spyware. It's a fantastic free program that you can install on your computer. And what it does, it removes tracking cookies. We, we send out all these, whenever we're on the internet, all these tracking cookies, they follow us around the net and they build surveillance profiles about us. Uh, so this spyware not only deletes all of, all of those tracking cookies, it'll look into your browsers, Chrome, Firefox, uh, Safari, and it'll make sure that there's no freeware or spyware extensions that are installed. It's a great little free program. Uh, and this is an equivalent on the Mac. It's called App Cleaner and Uninstaller. If you've, if I've got a Mac, if you've had your Mac for a while, sometimes these uh, programs after a while, it gets bloated. It's good to, to, to get rid of them, to get rid of old programs. Just like we've gotten rid of old programs on the internet, let's get rid of our old programs on our laptop as well. And on the next slide, we'll see why that's important. Uh, so we've got a map of Australia here. This is a program I use called Little Snitch, which is a firewall. So whenever I'm going around the internet, if, if it, in this case, I've gone to apple.com. Now, the I'm not only downloading information from Apple in California, I'm getting information from Tokyo, from uh, Japan, from Hong Kong, from India, from New Zealand. And this is because a lot of the internet's distributed around the world. So uh, this is why, as my colleague Wing has talked about a VPN, it's really important to have a VPN to uh, keep all of that information in a private tunnel. And on the right-hand side of this slide, we've got Privacy Badger, Ghostry, NordVPN. These are some uh, free programs that uh, can help kind of reduce your footprint online. And so the last slide to wrap it up, uh, surveillance capitalism, it's a big problem. It's, it's a massive, there's a, there's a saying called, if you do not pay for the product, you are the product. And, and it's kind of the business model around. Now, what's happened in recent times were first the uh, uh, Russians kind of built the playbook on how to use uh, all this information uh, uh, from Facebook, from uh, Instagram, from all, all these old accounts to try and use that to hack. And now uh, uh, China as well is is becoming much more adept in this. And here we've got a couple of uh, uh, so newspaper articles from the Washington Post with a series of major hacks, China builds a database on Americans. From the International Business Times, we have China has stolen the personal data of 80% of American adults. From Fox News, China has enough Stolen U.S. data to create dossiers on every Ameri American Senate panelist hold. And then NBC, we have China spent years collecting Americans' personal information. The U.S. just called it out. 
as this is a major problem at the moment. Uh, if, if I can leave, uh, uh, finish this slide and just say the importance of getting rid of all these old accounts and reducing your database, uh, reducing your online uh, footprint, it'll 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 mean we can relax and uh, it, it's uh, it, it means we're not broadcasting all this stuff about ourselves to the world. Thanks, Jake. Um, we'll jump back out into other ways you can protect your data. And first off, again, is good old antivirus. Right now, do I actually do we actually still need antivirus? Now, my short answer to that is yes, because ransomware is actually really big business now. It's quite a big problem that you hear in the news quite often. And you know, in in these um, unusual times, let's say, we all know how viruses and and, and vaccines work. Computer viruses and computer antivirus works in a very similar fashion, or, or traditionally works in a very similar fashion. For a computer virus, you know, for or a computer virus software provider, they need, actually need a sample to create the vaccine, right? And then through your antivirus updates, you get a copy of that the new vaccine to protect against that new new virus, computer virus, right? But the challenge that they have is that in an instant on a computer you can instantly mutate those computer viruses. And when you mutate them, they've never been seen in the wild before. Now, is AV broken can actually keep up? Now, Stuart McClure was a former McAfee executive and he was infamous for actually not running his own company's product. Right? I took a little screenshot from an article or an interview where he actually said he was asked about that and he admitted on stage, I don't actually, run security products and he had it since 1995. And what he ended up doing was creating a company called Silence. And uh, I'll go into that in the next slide. But when we, when I, when I'm ever asked to uh, recommend an antivirus, right, in my last couple of years in professional experience, I've come across two quite uh, unique offerings that you may not have heard of, right? It's not your traditional Norton or your McAfee, right? Or, or your Kaspersky. These two guys are relatively less of known, but they're actually really effective in tackling the problem of those mutations, right? Um, Silent Smart AV, we'll jump into that a little bit later. There's a link to obtain that. Both of these are, are um, have a cost to them, uh, and web root antivirus. Both are available for Mac, PC, and mobile platforms. So Stuart McClure, he founded Silence and actually wanted to tackle or fix the problem of, you know, antivirus being broken, right? How do you keep up? Um, and how this works is that what they've been able to do is to use machine learning and AI to train the computer to distill the DNA of a computer virus. So every time this little algorithm is shown a new program or a new mutant vi computer virus, it will, if it looks and smells like a virus it's seen before, it would actually stop it from running, right? And it do, does that by looking at many, many features of the file or the program and actually prevents the virus from ever running on your computer. And that's what they, in their marketing terms, allow them to call the predictive advantage of silence, right? This little slide actually on the left, it's showing you a list of some known ransomware uh, or some known uh, malware campaigns, right? And it's actually trying to demonstrate the number of months of advantage they had where the algorithm, you know, which might have been in the first line, 29 months prior to even the virus, the computer virus appearing in the wild, right? A 29 month old version of Silence was able to block that virus, right? And this is why Silence really impresses me. Webroot. Webroot is another really good one, and I came across this before I actually uh, came across Silence. It, it's, it's, it's a very simple and clever way to do it. If it's a known good file, it allows it to run. If it's a known bad file, it blocks it and quarantines it. But when it's one of those unknown files, those mutant viruses that I was talking about, it lets it run, right, which isn't the best thing to do, but it records every action that it takes. And if there's one hint of suspicious activity, it actually undoes or doesn't undo on every single action, right? And obviously there's some cloud capability and Webroot are actually uh, known for the Bright Cloud, which is one of the largest uh, security threat intelligence clouds on the internet. 
right? And this is a little bit of a marketing slide, but essentially they have a huge database of URLs and, and be, file behavior records and mobile apps of what is bad out on the internet, right? So when it do, is not sure, we'll actually look into their bright cloud to see if it's if it's ever seen it before. Now, when when it does see for the first time something it hasn't seen before, and it finds out that it's bad, it reports that new mutant back to the cloud, and then everyone who's using WebRoot is instantly protected. Okay, the next area is to keep your software up to date, right? Um, it's always important, everyone's probably heard, that you need to keep your Windows and your Mac operating system updated. But it's also equally important to keep your applications up to date. I highly recommend, if you're using Windows, a little uh, program called Patch My PC, right? It's free, and I've got a link to the YouTube video on how to set it up and install it and get it up and running, right? I encourage people who, you know, when you're setting up your computers, especially if you're tech technically minded and you support your community out there, when you're setting up PCs, do install um, Patch My PC and you know set up the automatic schedule and deploy the applications through here because it actually it helps you save time from going into each of the websites to download and install it. It actually silently installs and keeps up to date all the applications on your computer. Okay, but the crux of it, protecting your data, is really to encrypt your files, right? Now probably. Probably outside of, uh, if you're not in the field of cybersecurity, you've probably never heard of AES encryption, but you've probably heard of encryption because, you know, ciphers and encryption has actually been around for a very long time, right? It's, it's to hide messages when they're in transit, right? Now, AES stands for the Advanced Encryption Standard, and that's actually it was approved by the uh, US government for, for use, right? And when you choose to encrypt your files, always, you know, if there's an option, always look for something where it says AES, because it's probably the best option out there when it comes to encrypting your data. Now, I'm actually gonna drill into three little tools um, you can use to protect your data. Now, you've probably heard of zipping up files and compressing a bunch of files. I highly recommend using 7-zip. And the reason why that is, is, uh, when you right click on it and you know go through the steps one, two, three, you can see on the slide and add it to an archive, you can actually specify an encryption password, right? And that's all you have to do. The default encryption method is actually AES 256, right? So anyone who receives this zip file has to know the password before they can open that zip file. So that is a very good way if you're transporting or emailing files, put them into 7-zip if you're using Windows protect it with a password and then send it. Now, specifically for Word documents, I was actually recently made aware that the built-in Office protection, password protection is actually quite good. Previously, it was actually really easy to break, but that was a number of years ago. But if you have a look on Wikipedia, it actually says the default encryption for Office 2016 is AES, it says 256-bit AES, right? And the way to do that is, first of all, you click on File, you click on Info, and you choose the Protect Document uh, Encrypt with Password option. You specify the password. Now you can see in the bottom right, when you try to open a Word document or an Excel or a PowerPoint that's password protected, you'll actually be prompted for a password before you're able to open it. Right, and this keeps your documents safe on your computer. And what about PDFs? Because you know, often we, we, we send and receive information in PDFs if we don't want people to modify the documents. Right? If you're using Windows, I'm not sure if there's an equivalent on Mac. Jake might be able to fill me in later. I, will, I recommend using the Qt PDF Writer. It's actually a free uh, PDF writer product for Windows. Right. To do this with Adobe, you actually have to use the paid version. Now, you know, it, there's a link to uh, download and install the QPDF tool. Uh, but basically, you, you first of all, you just go and print your document and you choose the QPDF printer. Right. And all you have to do is add passwords. And you can see in the area uh, on, near the right of the slide that you, it, again, it uses a high 256-bit AES encryption. 
you know, you can specify the different options uh, that you want. And once you confirm the password, all right, and you save the document, when you open it in any PDF reader, it will prompt you for a password. Okay, so that's, uh, hopefully people will find that useful uh, to protect your files in 7-zip or Word and PDF document. And obviously, uh, very importantly, do do backups. I want, I'm sure everyone understands what a backup is. You know, you can cop make extra copies of your data in the cloud on USB drives, on portable hard drives as well, right? Because the whole reason why we use computers uh, is it is a tool at the end of the day. And the most important thing when we store on the computers is our data, be it photos or documents and information. All right, so wrapping up, all right, it's time for some action. Now, what I've tried to do in this area is to summarize some of those action steps that we've um, sprinkled across the, the, the uh, presentation. Now, I know we suggested a lot of actions there. So I've tried to try to summarize this. And if, you know, this is debatable probably between amongst ourselves and probably between me and Jake as well. But if you only did three things after this uh, presentation, we would probably highly recommend MFA, ensuring you have a really good antivirus like Silence and WebRoot, right? And go and review your privacy settings on your social accounts. And most importantly, make sure you've got backups, right? If your device is stolen or it actually just stops working, you still have your data or a copy of your data to work off. Drilling into email, you know, we recommended previously setting up MFA using a password manager and installing the Netcraft web filter. Under identity, we talked about your social media privacy settings and to use a VPN. And under data, we talked about installing an antivirus updating your software, backing up with your data, and you learned how to encrypt your data with 7-zip and use uh, passwords on Microsoft documents and PDFs. So time for some questions. Do we have any questions out there in the chat so far? We, we've got a couple. Uh, there's, is there something like 7-zip for Mac? Uh, now, I know that there is uh, a port for Linux um 7z um but in terms of mac there's a great website called alternative2.com and so what i can do is i can post it in that answer alternative2 kind of tells you you type in 7zip and it'll give you all the alternatives for mac but um if you want something that can also encrypt uh veracrypt is good it's our uh, french and that'll encrypt a folder it'll encrypt a partition um, but let me uh, post in that. Um, what about negatives? Do you want to answer that wing? Um, negatives to using a VPN? Negatives to using a VPN. Well, the main negative I see from using a VPN, especially if you're using a VPN on a smartphone, right, is that it will draw a huge amount of power, right? I, I remember when my friends were asking me about VPNs, they installed a VPN on their iPhone and it, it reduced the because it's always on and your phone is actually constantly communicating uh sending little bits of information out there you know checking if there's a new whatsapp message or whatever it actually draws a lot of power on off off on your phone so that's probably the main negative i see from using the vpn um otherwise um it really probably i always recommend using the paid services over the free services because i do believe there are free vpn services out there uh, but if people want to dive deeper into vpns i'm quite happy to uh you know take some questions offline to dive deeper into that were there any other questions uh yep i've got a, a can you recommend a backup tool i have multiple versions of my files on an external drive that I back up manually by copying across. Is there a better way? Uh, I, I do it manually as well. I'm not sure if, um, you know, I, I use pCloud, which is from Switzerland, and that's a cloud-based um, encryption backup. And it's kind of like Dropbox, but with much better security. So pCloud.com is, but it's paid. So that's that's one way. And other than that, uh, just um, uh, uh, just external hard drives and do a manual backup. But I'm not sure, Wing, if you can um, 
I'm I'm uh, more of a, a Windows user in general. So um, if it's a cloud service, um, I've come across Backblaze, right? Backblaze, B-A-C-K-B-L-A-Z-E. They're a cloud service, right? You install a little agent and it's charged per computer. The other tool that I recommend is probably an imaging tool like um, a Cronus, right? You just set a schedule and it completely backs up the image of your computer. So you can restore back into a clean state, right? So, you know, every day you just let it run or every week you let it run. And if anything happens to your computer, say for example, you start noticing it goes slow, which may mean that it's been compromised or has some malware on it, you just roll back to a previous day when you notice that it wasn't slow. One of the things I forgot to highlight also is, uh, I know a lot of you mentioned that mobile device security was very important to you. And I recall one of my colleagues actually uh, mentioning, well, how do you know, uh, when do you suspect your mobile device might be compromised or have a, a, a bit of malware on it? And one of the telltale signs that she said that everyone should be uh, conscious of is when your phone is really hot or warm for a long time, right? It's actually using a lot of power, right? Now, and I understand, and I just suggested that VPN might actually do that on your phone. But if there, if there is a little bit of malware and it's constantly working, it will draw a lot of power on your phone, right? So telltale sign is battery drain and the warm or a hot phone could be a sign that you should probably ditch that phone or wipe and reset that phone. Okay, so another question, um, and this is about digital fraud, which um, which is part of what what I'm studying at. Um, uh, Griffith University about criminology and why why this happens. Uh, I was asked, I was called just this week by someone pretending to be from my internet service provider. He wanted me to download a remote desktop so he could check my internet speed. I didn't hung up. What could they have accessed or done if I had given him access? Now he wouldn't have been able to get access. You, you did the correct thing. Uh, these are becoming increasingly Relevant. These are scams from the NBN, the ATO, the Australian Taxation Office. Now, normally to spot a scan, normally they want to, they put a urgency on it. Uh, normally they say they're from an authority figure, so like the police or the ATO or uh, the NBN. Uh, what I recommend, if 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 you get a bad gut feeling, it's always sometimes good to trust our guts. And if they say they're from the NBN and say, look, uh, give me your name and number and I'll ring back when I have time. They say, oh no, this is urgent. And it's like, but urgency is one of the ways in social engineering that people try and put pressure on you and say, and just, and so sorry, buddy, I don't have time. Uh, and, 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 you know, my mum's actually rung up the NBN and said, ah, oh, did you ring me? And it's like, no, no. So these are, uh, there, there is no way that if someone rings on your landline and asks you to install a remote desktop, if you didn't take, if if you didn't do any action steps, you're fine. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, and there's there's um, it's only when they get you to download like a foreign object that that could have um, that they can execute something on your computer. But again, like um, like Wing has recommended, Silence and some antiviruses. Uh, what that would probably do, it's got heuristics in there. So as soon as you download, if, if say for example, you believe the phone call and then you downloaded uh, uh, this remote desktop, uh, it might have recognized that it opened a port and uh, and maybe shut the port. Do, do you want to uh, expand on that wing or? So, so it, is, it is, like Jake said, it is a very common um, scam technique these days, all right? Um, and and, and uh, one of the techniques, if you are suspicious of calls, all right, just tell them, you know, if they say they're from the bank, you, you tell them, I'll ring you back on the bank number and I'll ask for you through the, the reception or the um, uh, to be put through to them, right? Um, and that generally means, you know, we'll catch them on the back foot, okay? If they just provide your mo their mobile number, I would not call that back. <laughs> um, but I would always I'd always look them up on the or phone book or their official published phone number and call them back that way whenever they say they're purporting to be from somewhere. 
Now, I understand that's a little bit off topic, but you because specifically you asked for what damage could have been done, I would agree with, with Jake. If you didn't install or run anything, you're most likely to be okay, right? If you did install or run anything, then anything could have happened. We can't tell. So next uh, question, our organization had our emails black listed by a strange online monitoring place. We couldn't use email for the day. Why would this have happened? We eventually got it sorted out, but I don't want it to happen again. Now, um, so I've worked a lot of a long time in Mexico, so I'll touch on something that may have happened similar, uh, especially in journalism. So there's a lot of um, as a state actors that want to censor uh, publishing houses, and so one th some things that they do is they complain to Facebook and they make up stories or any spam houses and try and get you on a list. And sometimes you've got to a, a, a contact that list. I believe they're called like XBL or the spam house, H-A-U-S dot org. Uh, so uh, that actual question, I probably need a little bit more information to kind of uh, investigate it forensically, but I'm not sure, uh, Wing, if you, if you want to touch on that. Yep. Um, so in, in my experience, um, what is commonly happening is that people who set up email servers they don't set them up securely. And what I mean by that is that uh, for the technically minded out there in the audience, they leave their email servers as open relays. And what that means is that any uh, spam um, related attack can leverage your server to send spam, okay? And when your server is constantly sending spam, it is highly likely that we'll get, end up on a blacklist. So that is probably the most common uh, avenue for someone's email servers to get blacklisted. Next question, is 3U tool secure? I use it for a while and start worrying about my data. Should, uh, I use it for a while and start worrying about my data on my iPhone. I haven't heard of 3U tools. And so if, if something in your gut tells you something's wrong there, I would, uh, you know, uh, 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 Google it. Uh, have it, and so that's how we kind of crowdsource um, if if something's legit or not. Um, put it into Google. Is three U tools secure? And if there's a lot of people in the community saying, "Hey, this is not a good application," um, it, it's probably, especially with these smaller apps, it's probably not secure. I'm not sure if you want to touch on that, Wing. Um, I think what you suggested is quite accurate. Um, you know, I don't, I personally haven't heard of that one myself either before. Um, and yeah, um, you'd have to do some research. Yeah, if you need some help with that, i um, quite happy to take that offline. We can look into it for you. Okay, have we got more? Uh, how do you set up email securely? I'll, I'll leave that one to you. Um, that's from Gabriella. Sorry, what was that one? Uh, how do you set up email securely? That's probably a bit beyond this uh, basics <laughs> um, uh, presentation. Um, I, I believe um, uh, Simone will talk about some uh, subsequent sessions where we can dive a bit deeper into setting up email servers. I, I do, my, my background is actually in securing systems, so uh, we can take that one off, offline. I'm quite happy to share some resources with you on that one. Now we have a, a thank you, sir, from Ali. A thank you, Ali, for attending. Uh, and we have our apps like Loomly that run a bunch of social media channels through one app, Secure. I haven't used Loomly. Um, what, what do you Not say? Not familiar with that one. I'm sorry. Um, but you know, my gut feel would say if you're if it, it is an aggregator, then you've probably given that app access to all your social media accounts. And to me personally, that doesn't get past my sniff test. And if you're not paying for it, uh, again, the golden rule of surveillance capitalism, if you do not pay for the product, you are the product. So that's how they make money. Any more? I think that's it. Over, over to you, Simone, I think. Great, but there's no more questions. Um, thank you so much, Jake and Wing, for your informative presentation. I've certainly learned a lot and I'm sure others uh, will have also. Just before we close, we would like uh, just to pop up the post webinar poll. 
to see how you would rate your level of cybersecurity after hearing the presentation, keeping in mind that one means that you still have absolutely no knowledge about cybersecurity, and 10 means that you feel like a bit of an expert now. So we'll just open that poll. We have a lot of fives, which is mid-range, which is good. Um, so um, please feel uh, free to contact us if you would like additional uh, inf advanced training in an upcoming workshop with Jacob and Ling, who've kindly offered uh, another workshop, uh, more intense and more practical. Uh, we're still finalising your time, but the workshop will be held in the next couple of weeks and it will be limited to a maximum of 10 people. This workshop is open to people with at least some IT knowledge. Um, thank you so much again to Jake and Wing. Your support is invaluable and I'm sure today's discussion will be have been of real help to viewers. Uh, we will circulate the video of the webinar in the next few days and you're very welcome to share it with your community. We'll also include links to ETAC's new flyer that you can use in your advocacy. And otherwise, thank you again for attending and we look forward to engaging with you during the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you.